Hello, fellow warriors. Welcome to another episode of Divided, Survived, and Thriving. I am Lila Aiken Ali, a divorcee, a divorce coach, and the founder of Split FYI, which is an online divorce community with like-minded and kindred spirits, rich in resources and information for anyone going through a divorce or separation. So as some of you know, I love interviewing badass humans who have not only survived divorce, but have come out the other side, to control of their lives and rewrote their story. These conversations are about turning the painful process of divorce into a positive force in your life. So I get to host so many stories of resilience, passion, grit, familiarity, embrace, and survival. So this is a great place to feel understood, motivated, and in community. Stories are our reminder that no matter how hard it gets, you can get through it. So without further ado, my guest for today is Robert Gates, <clears throat> a born Texan who renationalized as a Californian. Robert is an adventurous jack of all trades, finance executive who tasted those feelings of splitting already at the age of 15 when he left home. He would then meet his now ex-wife at the age of 17. His story is not short of a Hollywood indie film, for me, <laughs> full of resilience, self-realization, and determination. We will discover in more detail how his story also became one of codependency and a long journey of healing from childhood trauma. Thank you, Rob, for being here with us today. Of course. <laughs> so Rob, I often, um, you know, talk about the splitting sensation occurs, you know, when definitely when you go through divorce or so much that's going on when you, you split in many ways, sometimes you split with family members, sometimes you split with, you know, friends, there are, um, you split from the identity that you were, once was, were like, I'm a husband, now I'm not a husband, you know, so there are all these uh, areas of splitting. And I know that I mentioned in your intro that, you know, for you, you are, you already experienced split at the age of 15. So can we, can you just share with us a little bit about your story and where it all began? Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up in a, um, a very traditional household and the challenge for me, and this kind of translates um, into the marriage later, but the challenge for me when I was a kid was that my family did a really good job of making um, everything seem great on paper. So like, for example, the holidays, it was like a Norman Rockwell, you know, picturesque holiday scenario, every, you know, Christmas, Easter, you know, all the, the major events, everything looked great and it like felt normal. But then the day to day behind the scenes, you know, there was a lot of um, abuse and neglect and, you know, all kinds of things happening. And it was a struggle for me. I was just, uh, I struggled as a child with depression. It's in my family. There's multiple suicides. And you know, so there's a little bit of mental illness. And then so growing up in a family where you're basically acting like everything's okay and it's not, is um, you know, it's not a great foundation for a future relationship. But that's what I learned. I learned how to make everything look great on the outside. So survive financially and from an image standpoint and from society standpoint, but then just forget about what's happening inside, you know, just you neglect your, your, you know, your, your passions, your inner desires, you know, what feels right, what feels wrong. You just, let's just do, you know, so you become like a robot. I mean, you're just, you know, uh, so that's kind of my foundation in a way. And I didn't really realize how that played into my marriage until later in my life. But um, because of uh, the fact that I was, I felt like I was intuitive enough as a child to see this is not a healthy environment. And the only way for me to overcome it was to leave instead of, you know, develop myself, which is what you know, a lot of people try to do. You, you know, you, you can't run from everything. You've got to work on yourself. But, you know, I was too young. I had gotten into drugs and alcohol and all kinds of distractions. So instead of trying to figure out, you know, how do I make this work in this environment? I was like, I got to leave the environment, change environments. And, you know, so I got out, um, I stayed with the friends and, um, uh, Few, few you know, people here and there, and then I ended up leaving. This is in Missouri. I ended up leaving Missouri and moving to San Diego when I was about 16, and uh, just you know, no money, no plans, nothing. Just 
I knew a family that was here in Del Mar and um, they, they would take me in for a couple of weeks and they were friends of a friend in St. Louis. So I flew out here, stayed with them. And they had a beautiful home by the beach. So I was like, this is pretty good. I could do this. And they're like, well, this is going to be for two weeks and then you're on your own. And then I went from there to Escondido. So that well, wow. this lap of reality. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So Escondido is not <laughs> as nice as Del Mar. All of this at the age of what? When you were? Uh, 16. 16. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been incredibly hard though. And scary. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. scary. Yeah. So I had a lot of uncertainty. Um, I needed, you know, I need safety and, and uh, stability. And uh, I, I knew I was missing that. Um, and at some point I ended up, um, I'm just jumping around here, but I'm trying to, just, you know, relate it back to the marriage. But I, mm -hmm. at some point, I did meet, you know, my ex-wife, we were 17 years old and, you know, I met her at a movie theater because I was interested in film. I'd always love film. And, um, if there was something about just this, you know, this is the codependency part, but there was something about feeling like someone's got my back now, you know, and her, her family was amazing. You know, they were just kind and giving, I didn't have much money. I was living, you know, scraping by living from paycheck to paycheck. And, uh, you know, they would feed me and I was a big dude, you know, so I ate a lot. I was always hungry and I'd go to their house and have like this huge Italian meal. And I was like, oh my God, they give me leftovers. And so right away I felt like, you know, this warmth, this security and stability. And um, I latched onto it. And of course it was tied to, um, to Kim, who I met. You know, so I associated her with that as well at the time, you know, and, um, you know, so from there we, we dated for several years and uh, off and on. And all the way before we got until we got married, you know. And so I'm, I'll stop right there, so you can redirect it before I go into. No, I think no, I think that brings us to a perfect, you know, section of of marriage. So you know, you're you're young, you're dating, you're besotted by the whole family appeal, which I can completely understand. I mean, after what you've gone through, and then being on your own, and then having this caring family letting you in. I mean, that's. Uh, who wouldn't be, but how did you differentiate your, and if, did you even differentiate your emotions towards what that, what you were feeling towards that? And then the woman that you decided to marry, it was like, you're almost marrying a family rather than a, the woman, right? Yeah. yeah. And the feeling and, you know, it, and that's the problem. I think um, I didn't have that journey. I didn't have the discovery of, you know, what, what do I really want out of a marriage? I had, a, you know, a, a marriage, an uh, example of a marriage within my parents, they were traditional Catholic, divorce was not an option. And that's basically the way they looked at it. It wasn't a matter of, you know, how do we make our marriage work? It was a matter of, we don't have the option not to be married. Therefore, you know, it is what it is. And it wasn't, they didn't have any kind of um, like passionate, affectionate relationship. It was kind of awkward physically to watch them together. My mom would pull away from my dad, you know, and my dad didn't really you could tell he didn't like read her love language and he didn't really try to understand what she needed. So he'd come in to like kiss her and she'd be cooking and she, and every time she's like, Oh, not here, you know, or not now. And you think, you know, as a kid, I was smart enough to see okay, the, the, the repetition and it told me he doesn't care because he's doing the same thing over and over and she's not appreciating it. It's not working. Try something else. Wow. You know, and he was also very uh, patronizing with her almost like a fifties, you know, marriage or something like, Oh, look how cute you are. You wrote a check today, or you can do things too, you know, oh, right. just a homemaker, you, you know, and she had a degree, she had a master's degree and she was a teacher, but she took a lot of time off when we were kids you know, to raise me and my three sisters. Um, so anyway, that was my example. And then, right. uh, and again, I don't, you don't think about this when you're young, you don't think, well, how's this going to play into my adult life until when I, you know, find somebody for myself and how, what am I going to do? What am I not going to do? You just kind of, you, you, you let yourself be guided by your emotions sometimes. And if you're in a state like I was, where you're on your own, you're, you're uncertain, you're scared, and you, the emotional part of you, your emotional need becomes more important than your long-term goals of partnership and, you know, relationship. So that's kind of what happened. And I, again, I didn't realize a lot of this until I was well into my marriage, you know, but um, I did, you know, you, I feel like you can fall in love multiple times. I did fall in love. I cared, um, I cared for her greatly and she had a lot of great qualities and it made it easy. We were good friends. Our friendship grew, you know, so we were together a total of 25 years. So, um, there's some real, there's a real relationship there, but again, we, the foundation 
of the relationship was that of codependency. It was that of, you know, she made me feel secure, safe, stable. She liked the fact that she could do that for me. And right. what happened over the years, the, the, some of the patterns that we both saw as we started to analyze the relationship was, you know, a big one was that she, she, she and I were closer when I was struggling. So whenever I was down, if I was depressed or if I was, you know, struggling with uh, work or life goals, whatever it was, that's when she shined. And that's when I, we were closer. And when I was doing well, because I'm, I'm definitely a type A, I'm definitely ambitious and driven like to a crazy amount, but I also have this other side, you know, that is probably the, you know, the, the historical depression, whatever, but that can, that can, can knock me down sometimes. But when I'm up, you know, I'm good. And, you know, uh, it, it's weird because when I was up, we were so, we were distant at that point. So that was something that I always wondered about since I, you know, because it took me a few years to kind of get to a point where I was like, okay, I've got life. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the right path. And once I was there, that's when I started noticing this is probably like, you know, a few, uh, I don't know, maybe like a year in your marriage. Because we've been, we've been together from 17 to 25, so eight years, right, dating before we got married. And during that time, it was, I was not, I was, you know, struggling. I was trying to figure out who I am. I was, you know, working in LA, trying to be an actor, a writer, starting businesses. And then finally I got into my stride. And once I had that confident stride, that's when I started looking at, you know, is this serving me, you know, and, and how is this what I want? And, you know, uh, it's, it's hard because you're already in it. And, I was, and the way that I was raised, I was like, I've, I've already committed to her. She put in her time. I love her. Why would I just walk away from this? You know, so... I felt this pressure to do the next thing and, you know, get married, buy a house, have kids, you know, again, look good on paper because I never really resolved that. It just, you know, is everything that we have that's, that's, that we struggle with. If we don't deal with it, if we suppress it, it comes right back. So all those childhood, you know, things that I told you about where everything looked good on paper and we were creating this facade. Um, I didn't learn how not to do that in my life. So naturally, when it, when it came time for me, there I go. I'm, I'm back to, okay, how do I make my life look good on paper? Like, I, you know, like I, I was programmed to do as a kid. I didn't stop that programming, you know. So I fell right into it. And like within the first year, I mean, even even at the wedding, and I, this, I hate to say this, but my um, Kim, my ex would say this too. I wasn't there, you know, that day, the wedding day. On the altar, I was sweating. You just look at the video. I haven't watched the video one time for this reason, because I know I know what I'll see, you know. But I just felt like I, I she's a great person. I owe this to her. She's done, you know, she's done so much for me, and I want to take care of her. Like I want to help her out, and uh, that's what kept me, you know, moving forward. And then, like I said, within a year, it just came crashing down on me. I realized. It was like that talking head song, you know, like this is not my life, you know, I was just, right. but yeah. I'm here, <laughs> you know, yeah. so what do you do? How do you, and that, you know, and when you have that deep history, you're, you know, you're dismantling so much more than just the relationship that's connected to so many things that everybody I'm sure that watches this can would totally agree. Uh -huh. So you just, you sleep under the rug and that's what we did. We went to counseling in our first year of marriage. We tried, you know, we tried, you know, every several years, like this whole, you know, all these things started to emerge more and more. The codependencies, the fact that we started a relationship on a foundation of um, safety, security, not passion. You know, there was never real, there's never passion at all. So it's one of those things where, you know, I wondered in my mind, could, could you get, can you get passion if there was no passion? Can you light a fire that was never, lit can you still fire those never lit and some people will say that no you can't if it was never there it can't you know return because it's hard enough to bring it back if it's gone and that's what we you know we were kind of struggling with and each in our own way you know right. and my problem was i and i felt it more she was um on the other side where she was okay with that which she probably really wasn't but she had made herself okay with the fact that we didn't have this passion in our life so we connected as friends um, and, you know, for, you know, 10 years plus of our marriage, it was like, you know, she was like my sister. We had no physical relationship, you know, we just had fun together. We laughed and we focused on the good, you know, the good, the good aspects of the relationship. But the problem is that one piece that's missing can, um, poison the rest of the relationship. You know, it's, it's toxic and it, it manifests itself and how you talk to each other and how you see other people. I found myself looking out the window, looking at other couples and restaurants and bars and thinking, 
what is that? Uh, that one, something like that. And, you know, I started to crave and thirst for something else. And that's when you start to have even, you know, your, your behavior gets unhealthy, your thoughts are unhealthy and the other person, you know, starts to feel it, you know, and then they, they come back with resentment. Anyway, it's all kind of textbook at this point, but that's, um, yeah. It, I mean, it, 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 you can say it's textbook, but you know, every story, has a little tint of all of that anyway inside of it because you know when stories even in a marriage when it's loving and caring and there is a bit of passion passion can be lost because let's say things happen right and if you don't have that foundation and you don't have at least that connection or never had then it really makes it hard on those times right especially when you're needy for that I mean we're human beings we need that love and affection and that passionate connection that you know it's not just a, as a friend that sets us all apart right uh, our friendships our relationships apart <clears throat> but it, it, what's interesting to me is that you know it, it was a friendship sounded and it seemed like a friendship from the beginning and and that honorable side of you that said no I want to honor her and and you know become her husband what at the time, and I understand that it's you're thinking this is the right thing to do, but probably if you look back and go, well, actually, did I do her any service? Did I do her? I mean, did you ever think about that? Do you ever have any guilt inside of you of going, going, oh, was, did I even, if I was sweating at the, you know, at the altar, what, what was I thinking? And yeah, I did. I mean, she, and she would bring it up a lot. It's not that it wasn't talked about. I mean, she would say things like, um, uh, you know, you, 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 you married me for the, you know, the wrong reasons or you know, something like that would come up and she'd point out the fact that, you know, just remember you were sweating the altar and I would just downplay it. Like I was nervous, you know, it was hot. I run hot, you know, or she would say things like, you know, we don't, we, we never have sex, you know, and, right. and I, I would downplay that. And then, I mean, it got to the point, you know, where, um, I would let her uh, question my sexuality. That's how bad it was because I, I was I didn't want to hurt her and make her think it was her. Right. So I feel horrible saying that out loud, but um, I, you know, I just I I didn't know what else to do because I, I couldn't get where I needed to get in my you know in, in my mind in my in the heart in terms of the, that connection. That connection. I would, just, I would pray and hope that maybe it would just happen, you know, and I would try to like I would fantasize about it, imagine what it would be like, and. Um, and the way that I was raised with, you know, as being a Catholic, I mean, I felt the, the guilt has already been programmed into me, you know, so exactly um, the guilt keeps you from, you know, from moving forward there. It's a, you know, it's like a ball and chain. It's very restrictive. And, and then if you take a step further, I mean, you're, you're you know, you pray, you're, you're punishing yourself and you take your, 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 your um, you know, you're suffering the guilt and that's, you know, I realized that's a choice. And going through this this whole process has helped me with guilt in general because I've had that as a tool since I was a kid, and um, I think you you know you need to realize that your 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 role in that you know, and I think somebody said um, you know, uh, something about something about guilt happens but suffering is a choice you know, so just knowing um, that there's going to be a point where I I take accountability you know, for my actions and what didn't work and, you know, let it go. And that's, that was the hardest thing for me to do by far after the whole, you know, relationship ended was just to say, um, I'm okay with my failure in this relationship because that's, that's the way I see it. I, I, I don't see it. I mean, I, I, it's hard. It's, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with saying that it was a failed, you know, relationship and, and I had a role, a big role in that. But um, it doesn't, it's just, it's not easy because you find yourself going back in this post-mortem process and trying to, you really want to know well, what was it? I don't want to do this again. I want to grow, but I also don't want to beat myself up. So you're trying to go back and, and learn from your mistakes without punishing yourself in the process. Right. That's been my biggest challenge. So what are some of the things you did? And I mean, that, now you brought this up is, uh, first of all, how... How did you have that conversation? How did you guys have this realization? Okay, now after 25 years together, we need to go our separate ways. And I know it's been relatively amicable. I know we talked about that, but even then, how was that moment? How was that? How did you guys come to that conversation? 
Well, I like, um, like I think I talked to you about earlier, um, before this, uh, it was one of the things where there wasn't enough, um, I didn't have enough confidence, I guess, and, and, um, myself to get through it, to, 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 to do the right thing. So, um, like a lot of people probably, um, you, when you can't do something, you can't jump off the cliff, you know, you, you, you find ways to fall or, you know, you know, get pushed. Mm -hmm. So you set things up, you know, around you to create your, you know, you know, to get, to get to the next place. So, um, so what I'm talking about is sabotage essentially. So that was, um, I think that, that was what not started to naturally occur. And I didn't pick up on it until, you know, about 10 years or so in the relationship. But we, like I said, from day one, we struggled. We were in therapy our first year of marriage. So the signs were there, the behaviors were there. You know, we, we would go to, uh, we go places and we'd split up and then come back together. We were great um, in terms of like having a good friendship and hanging out together, vacationing together. We were good partners with the house and with our animals, but um, all the other signs were there. We just ignored them. And I, every time uh, the subject of sex would come up, we'd both get into an argument. She would be upset because um, we weren't having sex and there was something wrong with her. I'd be upset because she was accusing me of, you know, not being into her because it was, you know, it was a problem and it was something that was hard for me to acknowledge. So my, you know, my point is we had this repetition of you know, these arguments that would come up more and more frequently. And then we'd start talking to each other disrespectfully very easily, you know, and it was never like one thing I learned about, you know, after this and dating is that when you, you still have passion when you argue with somebody that you love and that you're connected to, you can still feel the passion beneath, you know, the arguing, you can tell, you can feel like I'm, when we're done, we're going to reconnect. I know we are, you know, but with, with her, um, it, it, there was no passion there. So we could talk to each other, like, you know, like brother and sister disrespectfully. And there was no like remorse. There was no, you know, we didn't come back together. We didn't have makeup sex or anything like that. So it was just this pattern of disrespect and, and it changes your, you know, how you see your, your partner and, and what their role is in your life. And again, it becomes more of this, like this family brother, sister dynamic. And, you know, you stop, you know, you know, you stop trying, you don't care and it's mutual. So we had enough of this going on and started chipping away at the friendship. So, like I said before, we did, we were missing one of these, you know, connections. If you look at like a pie, you know, maybe it was only um, a small slice of the pie, but it was a one, an impactful one that by not being there can, you know, be, be toxic for the rest of the pie. And right. sooner or later, it, again, it, can't, it came out in um, uh, all of our, our conversations and how we respect each other and how much time we spent together. Now our friendship that was strong started to get, you know, tarnished from it. Right. So that's when I think, you know, we could tell in the pattern, you know, it's like, here we go. Every year we have this period of time where we're arguing nonstop for a month or so. And then it goes away, we sweep under the rug, we do nothing about it. It's, it's the same thing that's been happening since day one. Right. And it just gets more and more frequent, you know, and that's what happened to us. And I found myself, um, and, I, and I, I've, been some, I've been somebody who's gone to therapy since I was a kid, by the way. So I talked to my therapist weekly about this for years and years. And my therapist told me that I, um, I should probably get divorced and do her a favor because it would be the right thing to do for her if I really cared about her. And I thought, no, I, I want to take care of her. That's the right thing to do. You know, I've, I've helped her get to a level in life. And this is me maybe taking more credit than I need to or just be feeling like a, a provider. But because she has a degree, she has her own job. You know, but um, I just felt like I was helping her have a better life by being in her life financially and giving her opportunity to do more things than she would do because it's hard on her own out here. So anyway, um, my therapist had given me that advice and I kept ignoring it for years. And I finally, um, she told me, you know, you're going to have these open doors and windows, which I'm sure all your, <laughs> all your people are familiar with. And it's true. I started looking at, okay, I'm like having these conversations with people with women on when I travel and I could feel myself getting like lit up, getting you know, moved. And I, I was like, this feels really good. I don't have this. And I started craving it. And now it wasn't a matter of just, um, it would happen you know, from time to time. Was, I was seeking it. I was looking for it. Right. And that's when I knew hey, this is going to be a real problem and I'm going to sabotage. I'm going to have an affair or something crazy is going to happen. 
my therapist said the same thing. She said, you're, you're, on, you're in these stages, you know, you're, you've divorced or you've left her emotionally, you're gone, you know, and she's doing the same thing with you. And now, you know, your friendship is, is, um, at stake, you know, the marriage is, is, you know, going to end, but you're going to also ruin the friendship if you don't do the right thing. So we had a conversation about it and because of the depth, you know, the history, it was, it was really intense. It turned, it went from like a, a serious conversation to like a yelling match to, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because she was afraid, you know, and the idea of separating, you know, freaked her out as it did not me, but then it became a matter of, you know, it, you're, um, you know, you don't like women or, um, it's your depression or it's, it's anything, but, you know, yeah. the, like the one obvious thing, you know, that was missing or, you know, the fact that we've struggled and that it could have been a relationship. So we, we talk about every other possibility, like it could be this, yeah. yeah. And I, I literally seek, I seeked out help around the relationship too, on my own. I saw a, um, a specialist that focuses on attachment disorder. If you know about that, there's abandonment attachment. And um, it's, you know, and it makes sense because of, you know, this, your split concept of when I was 15, you know, I'm afraid of, you know, being left, I'm afraid of being on my own in some cases. So um, I won't let somebody get too close when the intimacy comes in. Um, I, I lose a lot of other things. So it's hard for me to be intimate with somebody and have, all the other uh, qualities present, you know, the friendship, the passion, the love, the respect. You know, I feel like you have to have uh, trust, love, and respect. Those are the three things that I believe that you really have to have for a relationship to work. And there's ways that you demonstrate those. But um, for, for us, uh, you know, we, we, already, um, we were already missing, again, a, um, a lot of those main connections. And uh, after about probably six months or so just battling back and forth. I think we both realized that, you know, it's real. And I, um, I started to check out, I think the prop, the thing that I, the, the thing that I, I guess I'm, um, I'm, I wouldn't say, I guess it's maybe a shame is probably the right word, but I'm ashamed of is that I didn't have the courage and strength to just take action sooner. Cause I feel like, um, this, this was something that I felt inside me early on. Right. And it's different from her perspective because she doesn't know what, you know, she's, she's got her own journey. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was, uh, based on like what I said earlier, my childhood and how I, my, how I grew up and, um, my desire to have safety and stability and, and my care, my love for her. I, I didn't want to, I was afraid of what, I don't, like, what does this mean? It's, right. it's, it feels awful. It sounds awful. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to look it in the eye, you know? So I, that's the part that really is really hard for me is I let, you know, that last, our last year was really um, bad and, you know, yes, it was amicable, but um, it got, it got to a point where our friendship was definitely on the line and, and we, we did get through it. And we right. both realized after the fact that, you know, we, you know, we were missing a, a couple things that just weren't, that were never going to arrive. They, they were never there to begin with. So we, you know, to, to, to gain them after 25 years, you know, it's kind of like if you didn't have it after 25 years, you're not going to have it now. Right. You know, and that was the thing my therapist told me when um, I got, when things got really dark and I thought I can't do this to somebody that I love. I can't dismantle this. You know, she was back and forth, you know, she was for it. This makes sense. I agree. And then she would change her mind. So she was trying to pull me back. Yeah. It was really hard. I'm like, I've told you some really bad. I told you that I've had emotional affairs. I've told you that I'm like longing for something that we don't have. I'm looking at other couples and fantasizing, you know, after all this stuff I told you, you're still, you still want to, you know, to try to make this work. You know, you deserve way better. You know, that was her fear too, you know, but uh, my therapist always said, just remember, you know, when you're, when you're struggling, if there's one thing that you cannot, that that's going to prevent you from being happy in this relationship. And it's not attainable. And you decided I'm not going to have this. So say for us, you know, the passion, there was no passion. There was no you know, physical relationship. And if that, if, if that's something that you need, you desire it, you know, it's not going to be there. Then just ask yourself, is this going to change? No. Okay. And keep moving forward. And that, I think and so, what you're saying is so, so important because a lot of people, apart from compartmentalizing those feelings, you know, the guilt, 
the history, um, the friendship, uh, the togetherness. I mean, you two do it, were together for so long and objectively looking at it and saying, okay, the root of the reason why we can't be together is so strong and is so important to hold on to and not go back into, but we're our friends, but we are together. We are family. I mean, we're family, you're family, you know? Yeah. And, um, how many times you said that she was like a sister and you guys were like a sister and brother, which is, I hear this quite a bit in a relationship, you know, where two people get very obviously codependent and comfortable with one another, their relationship shifts. And it could have been one of passion in the beginning, in a sense, because it's new, you know, you're young, you're, you, 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 you're attracted to one another. Obviously there's something that attracts you, but that's not necessarily a passion that can sustain. Right. So a lot of people shift out of that, like, Oh, the, the newness of a relationship into one of kind of complacency and, and I don't want to say complacency in a bad negative way, just that, oh, it's shifted, we're friends, we're this, we get on, it's great. But then it adds up and that passion goes away and people underestimate how important that is. Now, if you are okay, if two people are okay to be in a relationship as a friendship for the rest of their lives, then that's all the power to them. That's okay. But if you know you need more and you're having an emotional affairs elsewhere or you're fighting constantly and hurting one another, then it's so important to go back to, okay, this is really why we're not to, we can't be together, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I can't imagine how hard that was because I, it's, I mean, given your history, given who you are as a person and how honorable you are um, in a relationship, it's, that must have been so challenging. I mean, I can't even imagine. Um, how did you guys, in the end, like, did you come up with a way of trying to keep some, you know, the foot in the door of, you know, friendship in any way? I mean, was it possible or did it need a break? Did it need time? Yeah, it had to, um, it had to, it had to break um, because it's weird. We were, we, we read that, you know, this is what needs to happen. Uh, there was a period where we were, it was almost uncomfortable. We were so kind of amicable about it. And right. I, I knew there was like, I kind of just felt like this, this isn't real. This isn't real. This is not like something's gonna, gonna blow up here. Like this can't, it can't be this way. We read the entire divorce, there's no way. And I think um, it's, it's when you start to realize the, the reality of what you're dismantling and what you're potentially losing and how your life is gonna change, that's when the, the feelings, the anger, the resentment, that's when it starts to come up. And that's what happened with us. So, we uh, went through that period, but I think we needed that to, to heal, you know, to feel, you know, they say you're supposed to feel anger and sadness and you shouldn't suppress these feelings if you're trying to get through something. You need to have uh, a feeling attached to it, you know, so and it, that justifies the journey, right? Right. Uh, so we went through that and then um, we have dogs. We have two dogs. Um, we've had four total. We had two dogs that lived to be 17. We never had kids. Um, I wanted kids and I believe she did too. It just it didn't work out. So our dogs were like our children. We had um, the, uh, two other dogs that are uh, six and eight, and they were like our kids. And so in the divorce, we split the dogs 50 50. So that's been um, keeping us in contact. And we've had to, you know, we don't actually have to. It's not like children, but it makes it a lot easier when you have something still left, you know, to, to handle the outside of the divorce. So when you know when we meet uh, and exchange the dog, we'll chat a little bit. We also have a um, a joint venture with a motorhome rental, and that keeps us you know communicating from time to time. And it's also an opportunity, though we'll say, for um, unhealthy communication and behavior. You know, because it, it goes from like this is business, we're exchanging our kids, our animals, whatever. To you know, by the way, are you? I saw you're dating somebody, or I saw something on Facebook, or. You know, right. just the little, the little digs, the side comments, and and then it brings you back. Like for me, that's been, you know, the second challenge is like trying to let go. I guess trying to let go of all this guilt was really hard for me. I'm still not completely there yet, by the way. But yeah. being when you're when you're um, in a situation with your ex and they're having a rough time and they don't have an issue bringing it up during these exchanges, then if you're not in a healthy place, it sucks you right back to where you right. were right in the middle of the divorce. And that's what's happened to me. I've had, it's almost like a relapse, you know, for a, a drug addict. I'm, I'm like, I think I got rid of the guilt. I've forgiven myself for my, my part in the relationship, what didn't work. And then, and I realized, nope, 
haven't actually gotten there yet. And she'll say something and she knows just what to say, like anybody would who's known with you for 25 years. So right. just a couple of sentences and like, boom, I don't deserve to be happy. Yeah. You know, I'm, and, you know, and you listen because it's like, that's the person you were the closest to your whole life. They know you. So that's, that was like a real, like, um, I was going to say mind F, but to like look at somebody that has been your trusted, advo- you know, advocate for your whole life and knows you better than your, your, your family, your siblings, and then have to not listen to them, not trust them. Right. And go and, and and turn into yourself and to turn to yourself for trust is a you know is a big step for me, and it was really hard to just again like listen to her um, comments about what I should be doing, who I should be dating, how I should be going forward with my life, and 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 not put too much credibility into it, not put any credibility into it, and just to turn it off because it's going to continue to come. And I thought, you know, maybe after a year or so, she'll she'll move on with her life, she'll be happy. And she'll want good things for me as well. And, you know, we won't have these, you know, exchanges, but they still come up, you know, it's been two years and uh, we just had like a week ago, I had an exchange with her and we got into a place where some old feelings came up and it was, you know, it was a um, little bit of a tough conversation. So, I mean, it's going to take, I, it's going to take a lot of time. It's like, a, you know, it's like dealing with death. There's a whole period of, you know, grief. Oh, it's you're going to go through Process. And it still comes up. It gets like it's dissipated over the years. And I haven't had a lot of death, but you know, I mean, to put like two dogs down in 17 years was really challenging for me. Right. I was surprised at how long the, the grief lasted and how even like a year, like five years, 10 years. So it's been about eight years since my last dog passed away. And if I start talking about too much, I will, I'll, I'll tear up. I can imagine. You know? And it's amazing. But in the same and with the, the marriage, you know, that was 25 years of a relationship. So like, that's going to take, I'm sure I'll always have pain associated with it. I don't think it'll ever go away. It's just a matter of, you know, how do I deal with it and how to, in a healthy way and, and how do I recognize it as not just a bad thing, you know, it's more of a process like so it's a journey, it's just part of the journey. It's part of the journey. I mean, the journey of healing and the journey of going through grief. I mean, there is no finite time, right? It takes as long as it takes, but it is your greatest teacher <clears throat> and something that you said, and I want to go back to is, and I always say this, is that, you know, divorce really does teach you when you separate from someone and you have that split, it does teach you how to be your best advocate, right? Your sure. own advocate. And that is fundamental in all of our lives. You know, your journey from leaving your family, whether you knew it or not, you're already on that process of, okay, I need to think for myself. I need to work for myself. Yeah. I got to do my own thing. And then you got into this situation that was so attractive because it was everything you longed for where then okay now you're getting taken care of right and so maybe you got derailed on that that process of being your advocate right and, yeah. right and then you found somebody who is your advocate and you know listen that is part of marriage and part of friendships and part of everything we always need a little check-in from somebody to remind us we're on the right track or maybe remind us who we are sometimes. It's the hardest thing to remind our own selves, like this is you, this is us, this is what we need, this is what we desire, right? Finding your story, right? Not your families, not your friends, not your partners, so hard, so hard. But I say that was my biggest gift when I went through a divorce. I'm like, oh, this is who I am. Wait a minute, I'm starting to learn what I like, what my needs are you know, what makes me happy and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I mean, it's not like I, like you, sometimes I get roped back in. I mean, I just got a text earlier from my ex-husband who has my daughter right now saying, oh, she's in the snow and she's loving the cold, unlike her mother. Okay. So I wasn't a big fan of the freezing cold. All right. But it was so funny that dig that, I mean, so long, but you know, it sends you into a spiral that you're like, oh, you know, but now at least I can just like kind of brush it off after yeah. two seconds of feeling like that before it would be getting me so angry. So stop. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you do, you know, there is a momentum in it and you do come out, but it is a process. And I always say, just allow it to happen and learn from it, right? Learn from why that's bothering you. And sometimes I say that when they're, they're digging on something, it's because you haven't figured out that thing yet. 
right? So if your ex is telling you who you should be dating or who you should be doing this, maybe it's, it's triggering something because maybe you don't know exactly what you want out of that, right? And I'm not psychoanalyzing your situation. I'm just saying in general, <laughs> just want to make that clear. Yeah. You know, in general, when they're doing something like that, it's because maybe you haven't had that realization for yourself yet. And that's why it's bothering you. That they're doing that. <laughs> Oh. But I mean, honestly, your story is, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's still going. And I love the fact that you have really, well, the fact that you have a therapist, you know, I know that, and I'm not going to generalize, but there's a lot of men out there who really don't seek therapy um, and go through their divorce, uh, sometimes not even realizing what hit them. Blame, there's a lot of blame on the other person and the other self. I mean, a lot of people, women and men in this, but, you know, um, and then don't look at themselves and see what role they had to play. And then the fact that you did, you do, and you continue to do, um, will only make it a little better for your next relationship. And I wanted to actually, before we f uh, finish this, I wanted to talk about <clears throat> dating after having been with somebody for 25 years. <laughs> What were your feelings? Because a lot of people come to me and it's usually women who are like, how do I get back on the dating scene? Like, how do I, you know, it's a little different for men, but you know, how can I trust again? How can I do this? How can I trust myself again? You know, there's all these questions. So I think that would be a great way to kind of end our conversation and just finding out some insight to a male's point of view. Um, you know, how did you feel about that? Was it scary? Was it exciting? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I may be different, but uh, I had a lot of friends were, uh, I mean, a lot of people I know been through divorce and a lot of the, um, the feedback was like, you know, a, a, that of excitement, like you get out there and start dating and meet a bunch of people and have fun. My attitude is like, I, I really don't want that. Like I, I like, uh, I'm, I'm very much monogamous and I like having a partner and, right. and that's just the way that I'm wired. I have three sisters and I have a different relationship with women. I think I'm like, um, I'm closer on the spectrum, you know, than, than a lot of men are right. you know, just because of that. And therefore, um, it was different. It was more of like, okay, I, I want to find, how do I find somebody that, um, I know I, I can, uh, settle down with, not, you know, not get married and meet there like that, but how, I just want, you know, I don't want to go through this, you know, dating process, you know, over and over. I'm not interested right. in, you know, I've met people my whole life. I know myself, you know, I know, I know what I'm looking for, you know, I, even though I, I learned in the relationship, um, uh, even the relationship wasn't successful, I learned within it, you know, what right. I did want, what, you know, what I needed. And so that was helpful. And I think that the main thing I thought, or I've been thinking and learning is how do I not um, fall into the old behaviors? Because when you, you have, it's almost like a muscle memory thing, you know, with your emotions and how you respond in relationships. So you jump out of one you've just done things in and out day in day out for 20 something years and you don't want to just start you put that the new person in that that role you know right so you've got to really separate and um you know let go of, of uh, you know, some of those behaviors and um uh, unhealthy you know pa you know patterns i guess and habits and that that was the hard part for me is trying not to put um anybody new uh, in that old position you know this is what they need to be for me, you know, and, you know, the, like the codependency and like you said, being your own advocate, you know, like that's something that I'm, I'm always reminding myself, right. I don't want to rely. I don't want to have that need to, to be okay, because it's also going to pull out the wrong part of the person I'm dating. You know, I don't want, I don't want to have that situation where we're closer when I'm down, you know, type. Right. So finding, you know, being able to find somebody that, um, that I can connect to when I'm up, you know, when I'm my best self and, right. you know, being able to do that on my own and her being able to do that on her own and we bring our you know, best selves together. And that's, you know, that's the goal. Right. So that was the, I think the hardest part again is just, you know, it's like, uh, you know, leaving a job where you were, you know, you were doing, you had bad habits and you were, when you were late all the time and you were returning emails late and then you go to another job and you want to like leave all those behaviors behind and start right. over. You know, so the longer you're together is the way I imagine the harder it probably is, you know, right. but, but like you said, um, the therapy is huge for me. I've, I'm, I know I've got challenges. I'm, I've got some OCD. I've got, you know, some depression. I've got a perfectionist. So 
you know, I, I have the challenges, but I'm always working on, you know, developing tools or using the tools that I have, you know, and to, to just to continue to get better and live a better life and, and, you know, do that through my relationships. So you knew what you wanted. You didn't want to speed date, which is great. Okay. That's, I think, scares a lot of people. They don't have to. And I think that part of it is putting out there and attracting the person that you want is knowing exactly what it is in the relationship that you want. So, um, and I think for men and women. So I just wanted to make it clear because a lot of women think that all men are out there just speed dating away and that's what they do. And it's not the desire for every man to be doing. It's also awesome. (laughs) So there is hope. <laughs> there is hope. There is hope. Hallelujah. Um, anyway, Robert, thank you for being here today. Honestly, this is a great insight and what a introspective um, journey you have been on and are continue to be on. And um, yeah, there's story of hope and, and everything in it. And it was it, just a great conversation. Actually, I love, I could listen to you forever. You're, I know you have so many stories um, and I know that you can, you know, we could even have another conversation around the healing and the therapy. So we might have to have you back again. Anytime. Um, yeah. um, anyway, for all the guests, this is, uh, we're done with this conversation, but we'll, I'll be having plenty more and you can find this on the Split Coach YouTube station and also split FYI, um, divided, survived, and thriving. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. So.